Watch Insider. My name is Brian. This and is I'm Tim. Tim. You know that already. And thank you for logging on. We've got an exciting show tonight for you. We've got a lot of watches here on the table from all across the gamut, which we will each discuss in turn. Uh, and as always on the Wednesday night show, guys, please ask us questions in the chat. We're here to answer uh, anything and everything that you want to know about. Uh, why don't we get started with a quick wrist check? I actually think it's a duplicate of last week's. Yeah, I'm going to be real quick because you guys have seen this watch, including literally 24 hours ago on Watches Live. This is the Zin EZM 1.1 that I'm going to make my own. I adore this piece. I love it. It's simple, it's German, it's tegumented, and it's a radial hand chrono. 60 minutes, everything you need, nothing you don't. Uh, I'll hand this over to Tim. He's got a better angle. Uh, so tonight uh, I am wearing a Roger Dubois. How do you, what's the best? You, you give me the French way. You know, we, we call it Roger Dubois, but we'll just call it Roger Dubois because we're here in the U.S. and that's Richemont's anointed pronunciation for the brand. So this is a rose gold sympathy uh, from the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and this is a bi-retrograde perpetual calendar. Um, you can, it's a Geneva Seal movement. Um, and as I've talked about on prior shows, uh, I've become a big fan of uh, Roger Dubois' early work. Um, so this is a watch I, I purchased several weeks back, and I really haven't taken it off since. Since last week, I put new shoes on the watch. I put a, uh, like a navy color blue suede strap on it just for, to make it a little bit more casual. I actually like this a lot better. You had a nice strap on it last week. This better balances the rose gold. You had a sort of honey gator on it last week that was indistinct in tone. This is a sharp contrast, both in terms of color and in texture, and I really like that. I want something a little bit closer to the color of the moon face. I think ultimately, it's a, which is maybe like a cerulean blue, but... You know. yeah. the, the challenge will be matching the luster. You're going to have to get some sort of polish or yeah. really shiny, lustrous leather. It can't be like a patent mat. It's got to be over the top. I would even say maybe a silicone strap might be the end of that search. Funny enough, the issue that I didn't even anticipate, though, is that um, Roger Bui actually uses a two millimeter width lug. So, um, spring bar, I'm sorry, spring bar. So it's uh, exceptionally thick and doesn't fit in uh, most straps. Yeah, so. so that's a great ABP, call them. Make great stuff out of Paris, including from animals you normally can't turn into leather. Just don't tell. All right, guys, thank you for joining us from around the world. Let me show you what I've got on the table tonight, because I've got two, but I've got two big ones. We're going to start with a Panerai I know you haven't seen because I haven't seen it. This is the first example of a PAM 78 I've ever encountered. I knew it was out there. A 2001 limited series in white gold, 42 millimeters. This is the Panerai for guys who are not into Panerai. Why only 75 of them? Well, the PAM 78 uses the old Omega 920 caliber, literally a vintage Omega Omega chrono stop chronograph movement. I, I have to show you how it works because it works like nothing else. You push and start like a conventional mono pusher, but rather than stopping and resetting like a conventional mono pusher, this particular movement stops and resets every single time. So regardless, you're going to measure something between 1 and 60 seconds and you're going to reset. Now you have a tachymeter scale outboard, the idea being that this will be a chronograph used to time things of very short duration or to gauge the speed of objects moving very quickly because it's calibrated to 400 as the base. So the timepiece is probably the most wearable Panerai you will ever encounter without verging on the, the feminine, the new world of 38 millimeter Panerai is not for me, but this definitely is. Again, with just 75 of these made back in 2001, it's rare to find one in this condition. It's rare to find one in any condition. I might as well do a wrist shot because I teased the compact proportions of this one. Now, what year did Richemont take over Panerai? 1997. Okay, so this was well after they took over, uh, well after they took over the brand, but still when they were still utilizing the movements of other oh, yeah. brands for their pieces. Yeah, this thing is 100% Lamagna based, and it's the Chronostop caliber. Uh, it was called the Omega 920 back in the Chronostop. You guys remember the Chronostop? It's that vintage Omega complication you can still buy for under a thousand bucks. Well, there's a highly elaborated version of that in this 42 millimeter white gold case. It's a gorgeous little thing. It's still water resistant in spite of being white gold and uh, something of a complex case assembly. This sits really nicely on a smaller wrist, and it's only 13 millimeters thick, which means you're right about in Rolex Submariner territory, both in terms of size and thickness. I like it a lot. It's even got a splash of color. By the way, Luminova dial, so this one still glows at night. It's a fun watch, and 
again, short of something like a PAM-80 independent, that's about as good as it gets in the world of old Panerai for me. And I think that these watches here that were produced again in the late 90s, early 2000s, almost had that old world Panerai feel to the, uh, to the shape of the case and the look of the dial still. So it's a way of getting a watch that almost feels and looks vintage without actually being an old watch. It also has that character, the early Panerai Special Series, when they felt special because they made few of them and every year it wasn't five, six watches, it was two or three and they were all mind-blowing. Compared to the standard Luminor and Radimir, they were incredible. They always used exotic movements. They were always scarce. They were always memorable designs. And back then, they were still doing a lot of things for the first time. Now every Panerai Special Series, oh, well, it's the one we had before, but with a blue dial. Back then, they were real originals. And in the case of this, kind of cut from a mold that was destroyed. So let's go with, let's go from the... Moving quick. The sensational to the sublime. This is... A new watch. I thought we were saving this one for last. Uh, we may as well lead with our best. Grubel Forsey GMT Earth. Now the watch is white gold, one of 33 made. This is the newest version of Grubel's GMT. You can see the North Pole, the equator, and the antipode. It's actually a 24-hour display by virtue of a mobile globe with 24 zones. You have a separate world time display just below it to make it easier to read. You've got a 24-second tourbillon angled at 30 degrees because that's how Grub will do. You've got a power reserve three days in spite of the relative mass of complications and that hyper 24-second tourbillon, which makes a circuit in 24 seconds. It's literally what it sounds like. You also have a GMT system. It's called the GMT Earth, and with good reason. You have this easy-to-use GMT pusher that allows you to quickly vary the reference time zone. And if you ever have to reason whether you're looking at AM or PM on local, you simply resort to the globe. If you've ever wondered what all that text on the Grubel 4C is all about, it's not just on the case, it's not just on the dial, it's on the underside of the Doran strap. And by the way, how sporty is that? Natural rubber strap on a Grubel. It's basically a mantra repeating their dedication to traditional craft, arts, fine finishing, and the savoir-faire or the know-how of the past. I saved you a lot of translation and eye strain. Grubel 4C GMT Earth, about $615,000. White gold, about 45 millimeters. So I think that this watch, um has probably become one of the most synonymous watches with the brand. So I think that if you ask a lot of folks that aren't sort of deep in the watch world or understanding, A, most people don't really know what Grubel Force is. Um, but for those that are really just, I guess, wetting their toes within the industry, this is the watch that comes to mind for most people. And as far as wearability goes, I know um, JBO Surf, you mentioned that it's not that wearable, but this one surprisingly is because of the shape of the lugs and the fact that the rubber strap is extremely soft. It really sort of bends down. I mean, we'll have Tim yeah. throw it on the wrist right now so you can shot. see. Yeah, do a quick wrist shot. Um, but, you know, obviously the price point is prohibitive for most, but, you know, I think that um, as far as the finishing goes, and specifically for Grubel Forse, I think that if you ask many watchmakers within the industry, even from the brands like Deba Thune and even from the main brands, they would say that Grubel Forse probably has the best finishing within the industry. Certainly the largest amount of it. It's one thing to be the best. It's another thing to execute it on a surface area that has to be considered the equivalent of five or six ordinary movements from Philippe Dufour. The sheer amount of space and the three dimensions, there's a depth to this movement. The movement is over nine millimeters thick and you can see all of it, including laterally. So it's visible to an extent not possible with a smaller case. People ask, why are they so big? I'm sure there's a bit of ego involved in trying to engage in one-upsmanship with the likes of Richard Mule and whatnot, but realistically, it lets you see of all, basically all for which you've paid. And if a smaller watch would be more discreet, it would also be less visible, including to the owner. And that's sort of the idea with Grubel Forsey. As you can see, even laterally, they've given you the ability to see the equatorial plane of that 360 globe they created. It's a sensational thing, and you don't go to the Louvre expecting to take home a master piece, you expect to see something sensational and singular and rare and take home a memory. And for me, 
the pleasure has been in experiencing a thing like this, and I'm glad to live in a world where it exists, even if I don't absolutely crave ownership of it. And interestingly enough, from the chat, Fat Sam EIE, I love reading these names, um, so wrote, facing. nicer than a Richard Mill, in my opinion. And, you know, that's it's a really interesting point because I think that as, you know, these super high price point watches become more common, specifically from a brand like a Grubel Forse or a Richard Mill. You know, when you see what Richard Mill produces in that six hundred thousand dollar price point, you know, you might be getting just a watch that generates a crazy name or a single tourbillon or or something along the lines. And I just think that on a comparative basis, again, if, you know, if you do look at it comparing the two brands, just how much you get with a Grubel Forse relative to a Richard Mill for a similar price point. It's a very impressive company. They're out in Le Chaux de Fonds and they have 100 employees to make between 80 and 100 watches. So it's, it's a rather impressive proposition. There are very few companies that have such a high ratio of employees to annual units. And the reason for that is that so much work goes into making that watch and so much of it is done under their single dramatically slanted roof, if you've seen a picture of the building. So I think there's an integrity in what they do. There are some companies that charge ridiculous amount of, amounts of money because they can, and you ask, well, what does it actually take to make that watch? And you can reason out that it takes relatively little. With Grubel Forsey, you don't second guess the time and energy that went into it. The only question really is, do you have the budget and do you have the taste? Because mm -hmm. it is a polarizing look. Yeah, exactly. By choice. Um, so guys, please keep the questions coming and we are going to keep talking about watches on the table. Um, next, why don't we do the, a little comparison between the two of these. Yeah, so definitely. I brought two pre-owned pieces because it seems like it's a fun topic to talk about. Um, so I have here a 16710, which uh, is the, that's the correct reference, is it not? Yes, 16710. And a 126710. So we've got the last iteration of the Rolex Pepsi before it was discontinued, and we have the latest iteration of the Rolex Pepsi. So both pre-owned, but both in you know relatively good shape. Uh, and I thought it would be fun to uh, compare and contrast and get people's opinions on the two watches. For sure. The interesting thing about this watch right here is that you can see side by side how much changed when you went to the super case versus the original case profile. In theory, and according to Rolex, these are both 40 millimeter watches, which means something had to give, and I think what went with some of the elegance of the original form, it had a versatility to it. It wasn't quite as squared off, it wasn't quite as massive. It was a 40 that wore like a 40. The new watch can still be worn on the same wrist, but it's definitely playing to a different taste. I, I get the feeling it's a 40 that's trying to play the role and look the part of a 42. That said, I do appreciate the return of the Jubilee, which from the first units in 1954, right up until the end of this generation, was always an alternative option on the GMT Master and the GMT Master II. It was only with the arrival of the GMT Master II six digit that we lost the Jubilee on the steel watch and really all of them. And it's nice to see it come back on the one, the 126710 that you see right here. Uh, the question ultimately becomes, will Rolex protect the owners of this watch and keep it exclusive to the Jubilee, or are we going to see an owner, um, I, I don't want to say betrayal, but are we going to see the arrival of a swappable oyster on that watch? Yeah, so I mean, I uh, I see that obviously the, the benefits of both versions of the watch. I happen to absolutely love the new Jubilee that they put it on it. I think that the it's probably the one the one area where the model has gotten flack was for that bracelet and you know of course many rolex collectors or rolex consumers really saw this watch being on an oyster bracelet i like that rolex did something a little bit different i like that they brought back the jubilee bracelet for sports models because i think that you're going to see the jubilee bracelet not just on this watch but on more watches moving forward and I've had it on the wrist. It's extremely comfortable, and I like the overall look. I think that it's one of those times where, you know, consumers or watch bloggers or whoever it is needed something to write about, and it was the only thing that they could really pick on the watch. Similar to how um, when 
Patek Philippe came out with the 5524G. The, you know, it was ragged on a little bit. But for the most part, the, you know, that watch has become insanely, you know, successful. It's done extremely well. And, of course, I mean, this is going to follow suit. But I, I think that it was a beautiful execution of the watch. I think the, the real standout here, other than the fact that you can see there's probably about twice as much metal in the crown guard structure of the newer watch, I, I think one of the most impressive contrast you can draw by having both of them is the difference in color between the older anodized aluminum Pepsi bezel and the newer ceramic. Uh, the ceramic is a crazy looking thing because regardless of what Rolex says, I don't think they were aiming for pastels when they designed this. I know they like to say it references the bake-like bezel of the original GMT Master. I, I think that's kind of an after-the-fact explanation. The fact is, this is blue and red. This is sort of, I don't know, the, the red is somewhere between red and fuchsia, and the blue is purple. But I think it's more wearable. I, I like the, I like the I like that it's less of a I mean less of a striking contrast than it's, on the original aluminum. It's certainly pretty. I, I don't I don't disagree with the notion that it's it's attractive and of course it's a lot more durable than the old. But it, it is a little bit quirky. I will say this though: the original watch, if you take a look, this was pretty much one of the last. This is a Z series one six seven one zero. It has the seven eight seven ninety eight bracelet, which means it also had solid end links. Of course, you still have hollow center links and a stamped clasp. But this is almost like buying a new vintage watch, or relatively speaking, because this was a two thousand seven model year and pretty much the end of the line for the five digit GMT Master Two. In many respects, you will find all otherwise. Is that plastic on it? Yeah, this one's like still wrapped. We must have. We must have received this one exceptionally fresh. Jesus. Yeah, th this thing looks like it's never been worn. I can't say that for a fact, but it is the latest spec. Last of the line Z series, no holes in the lugs, solid end link bracelet, absolutely immaculate bezel. They're not making any more of these, so get the best one you can find, and right now this is probably it. That's a nice watch. Let me see this. This is awesome. I like them both. I want the older one of the two. I can see. Jens Fredrickson joining us from Madrid, Spain. I can see Ray Bonifond, Clive Watch Wrangler, Peter K, Fat Sam, EIE. I can see Yukino. I can see Evil Z, Russell996, longtime viewer, Abdul Rahman, always watching, a good friend online in the comment threads, JBO Surf joining us from Australia. Mr. B and Mr. S and Jason Reeves all on board. Thanks, guys. Hell bop, welcome. Uh, Fat Sam saying he likes it a lot better than the Richard Mill. Yukino saying 650,000 is a crazy amount of coin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of is. There's no way to rationalize that. No, none. But hey, if you've got it, and someone else is saying Ferrari 812. Uh, honestly, I, I think you can get a Ferrari 812 for less than that. Like a lot, a lot less than that. Correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I want to say Ferrari 812 is like. What three fifty to four hundred thousand? Am I crazy? I have, price, no, I have no idea. Have prices risen that much since the F twelve? Okay. All right here, Ray, uh, Richard Bonanno is saying Grubel Four C is the real deal. That's a fact. It's a lot of real deal, but it's the real deal. And Canada, the best, joining us from Vancouver, BC. Fjord Prefect joining as well. Welcome, guys. Let me know what are your Grail watches. I, I want to know what your Grail watches are because we pretty much led with heavy metal tonight. Nothing but Grail watches. I like that so question. Far. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, let us know. send them over. Uh, well, let's keep going. So. Here we have a really interesting watch that came in, and it's something that I really don't see that often, which is why I thought it was something fun to bring onto the show. So here we have a Patek Philippe reference 5496P. Uh, so obviously P meaning platinum with a honey gold dial. So this is a reference that Patek has been producing for many years now with multiple different dial variations. So this is two dials ago, so not the most current variation of the watch, but the one right before that. And what I found most interesting about this particular watch is that it wasn't, it was a sleeper from that particular Basel year, but it was only a one year production. So they produced the watch for one year and then changed the dial color. And even more interesting than that is the only other time I've, I've recently seen a honey gold dial is on the reference 5207, which is one of their highest end grand complications. I want to say it's a minute repeater perpetual calendar tourbillon. Is that right? That particular one is a minute repeater perpetual calendar tourbillon. Yes, it is. It's also got the craziest case profile you've ever seen. You have your choice of engraved or later on, um, you had, there, there was a crazy rock mahogany. I think it was like 
obsidian mahogany or some crazy thing like that. But uh, yeah, that, that one doesn't come out too often. So if you want the honey gold or honey brown dial, this is it. This particular model came out in 2014. The original 2011 5496 was kind of antiseptic. Platinum case, nicely proportioned, handsome watch, center rotor perpetual retrograde date. But that one had a silver dial with a platinum case and it just left us cold. Patek put things right in 2014 with this 5496P-014. It's easy to remember, the 14 came out in 14. Like Brian said, it was a short-lived piece, and unless you're a baller and you're going for the 5207 in any of its variants, this is the only way you're going to get that dial. And by the way, the honey brown is Patek's term. That's not collector speak. That's not a nickname. They actually came up with that. and. Every time I hear that, I think of those honey bear bottles that people buy honey in. So I'll always associate this watch with that memory from my childhood. And, you know, what I thought was particularly interesting is that, you know, to take a dial that I want to say is so unique in coloring and have it on one of their highest end complications to then bring it down to a model like this, I think raises the bar of the model. And for such a short production cycle, this is a watch that I think has honestly fallen through the cracks in terms of consumers or collectors even really knowing about it. And the 5496, for better or for worse, I don't think gets the love that it deserves in that it's one of the largest watches that they make outside of grand complications. So when collectors or consumers complain that, oh, you know, Paddock doesn't make a dress watch that's large or that's big enough or they're too small, I think that this filled a, uh, fills sort of that void and you know once it's discontinued I think that you're you know number one I think that the 5496 is probably going to be discontinued sometime soon but I think that this is a watch that doesn't get uh, enough eyeballs and particularly this variation because I don't think it's overly dressy and you could put this on a more casual strap and, and wear the watch a lot more often. Yeah, the, uh, since the 5050, we've seen a couple of these quirky center rotor automatic retrograde perpetuals. I happen to prefer this look the best. Granted, you lose the exquisite 240 micro rotor, but the 324 is a reliable and tough timekeeper, and I just find this watch a heck of a lot easier to read. Aperture day, aperture month, aperture leap year cycle, and then a retrograde date with a big indicator. Easy to read, nicely balanced. Like Brian said, it's a larger size for Patek at 39.5. I find that this is a wonderful piece because not only does it have a unique look to it, not only does it have a special dial with a fun name, but the watch even comes with a platinum case back. So if you want the display case back and you're willing to deal with a little bit more thickness, you can put that in. Patek also gives you the platinum so they're not shorting you an ounce of platinum in favor of a $30 sapphire, you get both. And that, to me, is a mark of integrity. It's one of the reasons why I consider Patek Philippe to be a mostly uncompromised brand. Uh, we could use some investment in the Nautilus line, but for the most part, the company does keep the faith with quality. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you want to read some of the Grail watches? Yeah, definitely. People, let's let's go. I've been uh, sending them over. Okay, yeah, let's, let's go with the Grail watch. Lead, lead off, Brian. Okay, we've got here, we've got B. Bobierdo, 5101P, BS, Patek Philippe, 5320G, beautiful watch. Um, what else do we have here? LFJ, Patek 5170G, a lot of Pateks. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Matt Forster, Grunfeld, 1941, Grubel Forsay, Signature 1. This is definitely some interesting pieces. Uh, Russell, 996, 5370P, awesome watch. Um, what else? Andrew, ST12, your 15300 in blue from yesterday. Amazing watch. I ironically was going to answer uh, to Lang Mac, who's asking about whether to do a 15400 or a 15202. I was actually going to throw in there that a 15300 blue is another good watch to sort of look at as a cross between yeah. the two pieces. I, I, would, I would take that one. That's the wearable one. That's also the one with the screw down crown that you can actually use like a sports watch. You can swim on the surface with it. I'd swear by swimming with a 50 meter screw down, I would not take the 15202 in the water, even if it's a 50 meters it's not a 50 meter I can see Jan, Jan Wilhelm Koster saying uh, Breguet 5447 rose gold minute repeater that'd be a gorgeous piece yeah we just actually took in a um, 15300 ST with a silver dial I don't even know if it's been posted yet that was just fully factory service so it's amazing how um, how many of a watch you think can be produced at the time or how because I, I still it's one of those few watches where I do remember when when AP was still making that watch in the chronos and they were readily available I mean you could buy the watch at any retailer you could buy the watch at any AP establishment and you just thought okay it's a normal production watch they're Especially available they're out the there dial. and now they're gone 
And you don't really even see them come available in the pre-owned market that often, so it like, makes you wonder like, how many were even really made or where did they all go? Yeah, well, it was a kinder, gentler era of AP. If you've seen the speed that those uh, alphanumerics have started stepping up every 100,000, they jump to the next letter and it's sequential, you can figure out just how quickly production has ramped up from the mid-2000s. You know, they say they're holding it to 40,000 a year. I'd say it's probably 40,000 a year, plus or minus 10 to 15,000. No one really knows, but I'll say this. The 15300 with a blue galvanized dial is the one to own. We did just take one in, and I had it on watches live last night. That would be my choice of the entire lot, either that or an original 5402, because, you know, the first is the first. Mm -hmm. I will also say that Robert Duong is saying, Blompomp Tornick Rayville TR900. Hey, if you can find one that wasn't junked with hazardous waste by the military, you are the man. Those things look the business, and the blasted finish never survives to the modern era. That's a cool piece. That's a legitimately cool piece. All right, so let's talk about the last watch that we have on the table because this is one of my... That's a uh, fun watch. Yeah, it's a fun watch, and it happens to be one of my favorites that's on the table right now. Um, so here we have a... Uh, and I'm sure that I've brought different variations of the watch on the show before, just because every time I see one, I you know I love it even more. So here we have a Blanc Pond All Titanium Le Mans Flyback Chrono. Um, it is a, is a 37 millimeter watch. Believe it or not, this guy right here is a 40. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh wow. So 40 millimeter watch with a rubberized strap with threading there. So it almost looks a little bit more like a like a traditional strap, but it is rubber. And you have a to tight blah. Yeah. Tongue tied titanium deployment buckle. So, what honestly really draws me to the watch, number one, is the small compact size and the wearability of the piece, as well as just how it's just. I, I don't. I just. I just feel like as far as the proportions go, it's just perfect. And this was a watch that they produced, you know, into the you know latter part, I guess, of 2000. You mentioned 2011. I think you said. Yeah, I believe that was probably the cutoff for this model. And I just think that it has like a. A, a, a feel to it where it looks like it was produced 20 years ago. There was a remarkable consistency about the Le Mans line. At one point, they did kind of jump up from 38 to 40 millimeters, but they looked the same for a long time, and I usually consider that to the credit of a brand that doesn't strive for planned obsolescence. Design continuity is a good thing. It's a strength, not a weakness. Two features I really love with this watch. The first is the color on the dial. I adore it. There's a little bit of the key lime to the Luminova when you see it in person. And of course, you have those shocks of red with the red seconds hand. But you also have a double finish. So there is a, there is a matte metallic anthracite about the hour track. And you'll see the same on the registers. And then there's a high gloss for the chronograph seconds out board in the central dial and it's the differential color and finish that really makes this dial plus there's the fact that the case itself is wonderfully understated in satin finished titanium and of course it's a very high grade vertical clutch column wheel five position adjusted automatic flyback chronograph it's the f-185 caliber one of the true unsung heroes of modern high horology. This movement's appeared in a million different watches, but it's been superb in all applications. And in fact, a variation of this, the 1185, still does business in the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak chronograph. And you know what? It still, it still fits the part. It's still a high-end movement. It inspired the Rolex 4130. So that's a claim to fame if ever there were one. I honestly think that one of these is going to be my next, my next watch that I take down. I, I've been a big fan of these Blanc Pond uh, flybacks for such a long time now, and you know what? Like with with the market the way that it is, I think that there's so much value in these types of pieces that you can find, and prices are still you know they're repressed on watches like this. I think that now is a really good time to buy watch you know buy you know Blanc Pond's Jaegers, you know a Gerard Perigo that we're about to show because you know obviously Paddock, Rolex, um, AP, Richard Mill are all booming and are all incredibly powerful in the marketplace right now as far as pre-owned values go. But I think that there are still really good buys out there. And it's watches like this where they're they're beautiful, they're well made, um, and I think that you can just find you know value in watches like this. And overall, I honestly just like watches that are different that you don't see on everybody's wrists. I'll also say this, guys. You can get that same movement in a 50 Fathoms flyback chrono, but it can be downright unwieldy. That's a nice case that you can wear in any situation. The size is versatile. The look is subdued. It's upscale without being flamboyant. It doesn't shout, hey, look at me, but it has a wonderful, tasteful, understated elegance about it. And that's why I prefer that particular take on Blumpon's flyback. Chronos. Uh, that said, you can get a grand name from out of the blue for almost no money at all. 
Compared to what you'd pay for a modern Gerard Pergo 1966, there's nothing wrong with going back to the classic from the 1990s. This was a special piece. So, sorry, I was just uh, talking oh, no, in the chat. Um, so, I know that we don't really bring dress watches on the show all too often, but you know, this watch, 36 millimeters, rose gold, you know, stark white dial, automatic movement, center seconds hand. I thought that it had a really cool camel colored croc strap. The watch fits exceptionally well. It's an automatic GP movement. And I think that this is a prime example of, again, of where we're talking about value, where you can buy a pre-owned GP, all rose gold case, rose gold deployment yeah, De full, full deployment in rose gold. Full. De I keep saying deployment. I need. It's like I need like a like a shocker every time I say it. Uh, deployment in rose gold for under five thousand dollars. And I think that this is just an example of the type of value that's out there. That if you're willing to pounce on a watch like this, now there's now's the time to do it because these watches ultimately I think will come back. And I think that as the pre-owned market becomes more transparent and starts to rise, you're going to see the prices of these types of watches move up. Wonderful Luigi Macaluso era GP. By the way, guys, eight millimeters thick, neck and neck with your 15202s right there. A lovely piece, and the 3100 is a full featured caliber, 46 hour power reserve, manufacturer movement, quick set, hacking seconds. You really give up nothing. Remember, this movement was used in chronometer certified Vacheron overseas in the 90s. So it's, it's a thoroughbred, ultra thin manufacturer automatic right up there with the likes of the JLC 889 from the same time, as well as the Zenith 680. This is a special piece right here, and I think we have it priced somewhere around 5000 bucks or some such thing. Yeah, so beautiful watch, um, and again, it's, it's hard to find like interesting things to bring on the show every week. It's just, you know, but uh, we do what we can. I like that. Okay, guys, let's see. We have any more Grail watches to head out right here. JBO Surf, Patek 3670. Yeah, I think that's, that's on a lot of lists. That's... Oh, 16 people will have the pleasure, right? That's on a lot of lists. We that, sold one of those. We had one? We, we, we sold had one. one of the 16? We sold one of the 16. Wow. Then again, I shouldn't be surprised. We've got a couple of 50 16s right now, and every one of the 50 16s is the ultimate 50 16. So we've got some crazy stuff if you guys ever want to stop by Bala Kenwood. And I can see right here, uh, Richard is saying the Gerard Pergo 1966 is beautiful. Great news, that's not the 1966. It's better than the 1966. The original ultra-thin Gerard Pergo automatic dress watch from the 90s, that was the predecessor to the 1966. And frankly, the proportion of the older watch is a little bit nicer. Let's do uh, one more question here that just came in. Brian and Tim, what do you think of IWC's latest engineer line? I feel like it hasn't gotten any love at all, dot, dot, dot. Um, you know what, I think that with so many, so many watches constantly coming out now that it's hard for, and with the way that the production cycle of watches, we're having so many launches going on at an SIHH or at a Basel World that sometimes a new product line gets lost in the messaging, and that you know, with if it was a more periodic launch where you know in the fall they launch and then so on and so forth throughout the year, I think that it would have gotten call it more love and attention. But you know what, it's it's tough. I mean, IWC's pilot line is doing better than ever, and I think that that has really become synonymous with the brand. And you know, it's hard to gain traction when one line almost uh, is, one line has taken credit almost for the whole brand. And if you're thinking about buying a, you know, an IWC, the first thing that comes to mind for the most part is Portuguese or pilot. And it becomes tough to get outside of that routine and then move into other product lines. And again, you have the Aqua Timer, which same thing. Beautiful watches. I brought them on the show. I think that they're incredibly well designed, and even they don't even get the love that I think they, that they should get. Here's what I think about the new Ingenieur line. I think the problem is that it doesn't look visibly related to IWC's well-established design language for the Ingenieur. There was a Genta design that was basically the key for the Ingenieur since Oh my God, it goes back to the late 1970s. It was a good foundation, and by breaking with that completely, IWC has severed itself from a solid and historically revered design continuity. It's one thing to refresh an icon. You can do that. AP does it all the time. Patek does it. But to completely cut the cord was not a good idea. The other problem is, when you have a watch called Ingenieur, you expect it to be a 
relatively no-nonsense, clear-cut technician-style watch along the lines of the original Ingenieur or the Rolex Milgauss. And it's not. It's sort of a light-duty sports watch or a somewhat more rugged dress watch. I'm not really sure. It's in a no-man's land design-wise between different genres and different eras of IWC. They've cut the cord to a strong design foundation without replacing it with something strong. And that's always a recipe for failure. Very rarely do you sever your link to a glorious past and replace it with something equivalent. You usually downgrade. Evolution sometimes can be revolutionary, and I think in this case, IWC inverted that notion. All right. Um, so again, that's all that we have for tonight. I thank you guys all for logging on. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm Tim. And thank you guys for logging on tonight.